Those on Skype, especially from Ireland, may not realize this is 4th of July, Independence Day in this great country <laughs> that needs Jesus very badly. Um, so in honor of that, I'd like to ask Deb, Mallory, Kelly, and Lindsay to come up. Okay. So these are the patriots of the fellowship. We have Debbie, because you can't see right there. Mallory, Kelly's boots. You have to see the boots. And then in honor of America, we have America's team. Lindsay. Go Cowboys. You may be seated. Even though this thing's thin, I'm taking it off. What? Maybe that's what I should have done. Let's put it on the inside out. I don't know. I'm kind of digging on that. Thank you, milady. Not a reference to Steve, if you're on there. Shall not say another word. <laughs> okay, how am I going to preach then? <laughs> okay, we are in um, Genesis chapter 15. And I want to go ahead and catch us up because it's been a little while and I'll need to catch us up after I'm gone <laughs> the next two weeks. So, uh, I'm going to uh, read from verse 8 <clears throat> down to verse 18. Okay. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, we'll stop there. Um, I know that it's probably um, would be self-evident, but I, I like that the Lord said to Abraham, you know, bring me these, bring me this. Uh, I mean, in fact, he says, take me, take me and heifer and these different things. And so he goes and he, get, he gains, he gets them and he brings them back and um, and he begins to divide them. 
Abraham does. He doesn't, God doesn't tell him what to do. And I'll just say this about that. It's, of course, it's self-evident, but on another hand, I get the feeling that Abraham at least understands God and he understands him in terms of crucified language, that this is a language, that this offering, that this altar, that these things that are being offered up is a language, and it's a language that God speaks, and it's a language that God understands, and Abraham, or Abram had plenty of experience up to this point already, I mean, uh, with altars. This one is more specific because the others, it didn't really tell what he offered, but this one, God tells him. God says, this is what will satisfy me. This is what I want. This is, this is the thing. And, um, and so there is this interchange taking place there between Abraham, between Abram and between God where God is actually expressing his desire in reference to offerings, in reference to sacrifice, in reference to altars. And Abram is, is, is communing. He's communing with the Lord in that. He's finding out what's in the Lord's heart. He's, he's He's hearing his language. He's trying to reach more into the heart of God, and I believe that he was. I mean, he was the one that was called a friend of God. We'll get into that eventually, but friend of God. So there are reasons to believe that Abram um, took advantage of the opportunities that the, that the Lord gave him. He could have just done exactly what the Lord said and said, okay, and not, not given it any, any thought, just, okay, that's what, if this is what you want, you know, it's like this, this Bible or whatever you hand, if this is what you want here, instead of, hmm, you're very specific here, you have, you're, you're speaking in, not in terms of me and I'll have a seed and I'll have some land. You're speaking in terms of you and what satisfies you and what avenue you would take to express to me how I'm going to inherit the land how the seed is going to come forth, how I can know that, where, where of shall I know, whereby shall I know, whereby shall I know. <clears throat> and so these scriptures that I've read probably, um, which is probably a good thing, probably the next time I share, which will be skipping a couple of weeks here because I'll be in over there with some of you, um, uh, I'll be able to come back and then not reshare, but within the same verses, we can see more even. We can see more. We can, we can see more of what's going on here because there's, I mean, you heard, you heard what we read right there. There's some stuff going on there. There's some stuff. That's, you know, and God's talking and he's, he's, he's talking over the sacrifice and he's, and he's, you know, talking about the future and, and all of this. And uh, so we'll be able to come back and, and take some different angles of this as we go. Um, we got down actually to verse uh, 10, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and then into, but we didn't get into verse 11. So I'm going to just reread verse 10 and 11. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. We, we've gone through that one a bit. And now verse 11, And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
Now, you know, if you, if you want to understand that, I think the best way to do would be to, um, to get Jesus' view of that. Um, and Jesus gives us somewhat of a view in relationship to that in Mark chapter 4 and uh, verse 3. And then he gives the explanation of that in verse 13. And uh, we'll probably go anyway. Mark chapter 4 verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Okay, so. We go, okay, they went out of sower to sow, but Mark says, hearken. See, none of these words, God doesn't just throw words out there, you know. If, if there's a word in there that's there for a reason, it's not just a, it'll, it'll sound grammatically more correct, or in fact, he's not really big on that necessarily. Uh, he's, uh, we are, <laughs> because, but... He's not because he's trying to communicate his words as spirit and life. Spirit and life. And again, you've heard me share this before, but, but shame on us if we go to the scriptures and we don't cry out every time, Lord, this is not ink on white paper. You said, Jesus, you said it was spirit and life. And I want to get spirit and life out of this. I don't want to just read stuff. Hearken. Behold. And we don't, we don't see that. We'll deal with behold later. Some of you already know what I'm going to say about that. But I'll give some good scriptures to fortify that. <clears throat> but to hearken means to pay attention to to get involved with what's about to be said to make it your story not just a story in the Bible to make the mind of the Lord as he's speaking here and this is Jesus speaking to make the mind of the Lord as Jesus is speaking um, be well, not just the mind of the Lord, but the heart of the Lord, because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and so he's speaking. And we can just grab words and make theology out of it, or we can say, what's really in your heart with these words? What do you really want us to get? Because anybody can just read the words and go, okay, I got it, right? I mean, you can only, anybody can just read the words and go, this is it, and I got it, and I understand it. Okay, well, good. Good. You understand the story then? That's fine. But do you understand the heart of Jesus in that story and what he really wants to communicate? That's the thing. So um, we have to reciprocate that heart. And if we do then we don't have to have reminders around, little things written on the mirror or, or things written in our Bible that says, um, okay, we need to be serious. <laughs> you, know, you kind of understand what I'm saying. It's not, it, it's like, I want your heart. I want to know you. I have a desire for you to speak to me. It sounds like you speak to Randy. We don't know, but we'd like to hear. <laughs> you know, we'd like to. We'd like to hear from the Lord. And my desire is not to speak to you so that you get what I'm saying. That's not my desire at all. And I pray. I pray. I always pray. And I pray that the that that the Father will be able to glorify His Son. The Son will be able to glorify the Father. The Spirit will be able to lift up the Son and to declare the Son. And and. That's a whole different thing going on in a class. That's, that's three here that we can't see. That's three at work. That's the fullness of the Godhead there. That's the Trinity. And all my prayer is that they can, that it can be about them instead of about us. <laughs> it's really not. 
no thought of us other than as the Spirit of God brings forth the Lord in it, then it's spirit and life. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air. So there we have our thing in, in uh, Genesis 15, we had the sacrifice being offered and the fowls of the air coming down on it. Well, let's find out what the fowls of the air are. Fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Okay, so these are not like, um, like lovebirds coming down. <laughs> okay, that's not what's happening here. These are vultures, okay? And we'll get into that probably, you know, when we come back. But they're, their job is in relationship to picking apart what's dead. Um, in verse 13, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Um, remember, we just did verse 3, and now we're doing verse 13. And he said unto them, Know ye not that uh, this parable, and how then will you know all parables? <laughs> Woohoo! The sower soweth the word. The word, the word, the word, the word, the living word, the word, not just, he's not show, sowing the scriptures. He's sowing the word. And there's another example right there. You've got the scriptures, but within this is the living word. And if we don't recognize that, then we're just Pharisees that are, as I said, looking at ink on white paper and studying it and going, okay, now what's the Greek say about this? And, you know, I look up the Greek many times, but I am, I am not looking for answers from there. I'm looking for an understanding of what the words are so that the Spirit of God can speak to my heart. In other words, we want the word. We want the word sown into us. We want it life. We want it spirit. So... Verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. All right, so um, our verse back in Genesis now in 15 says, and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. All right. All right, so the altar represents the cross. It, um, when we use the word altar around here, most of the time we're referring to the cross or we're referring to an altar in the scriptures that we believe refers to the cross. Um, and uh, when the scriptures talk about the fowls coming down and they're, as it were, picking at the, the word, the altar, the cross. For us, it, it says, and Abram drove them away. He drove them away. All right, so two things. You've got an altar with sacrifice, with the, th the things that are being offered, and you've got Abram standing there offering those things. All right. <clears throat> The fowls of the air are not coming down to attack you. Now that would be, you know, some of you have heard that for years from me, but that would be a good thing to start asking the Lord the spirit of that because we still sometimes keep ourselves as the focus of that. We make, well, the enemy's attacking me because he doesn't want me to get Jesus. Well, that's exactly right, but he's, you know, even in the parable of the sower, he's not, a, you know, Jesus said there's seed by the wayside and there's seed, you know, among thorns and there's seed, you know, good ground and there's, there's th those kinds of ground, but the fowls of the air are not coming and attacking the grounds. They're attacking the seed. They're trying to get the seed out of you. All right. So would the, would the, would the enemy 
be okay with you just learning doctrine and stuff? Yeah, because that's not the seed. You know, Galatians 3.16 says which seed is Christ. Okay. Jesus says here it's the word in you, which is him. He is. Anybody ever read John 1? 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Him who? It didn't name the name of Jesus. It didn't name, it didn't say God. It didn't, didn't use any of the words we're familiar with. It says all things were made by the word. Well, spiritually, that's true too. God takes the word, not just the scripture, but yes, you have to go to the scripture, but he takes the word and there's where the work begins to be done. And that's why we, as it were, reverence the word. We don't, you know, we don't reverence the, the scriptures in the sense of, well, I mean, you're liable to see me take a Bible and then just throw it up there on the stage when I'm through and then start talking or something. And, and I, I did that when I was in Bible school and a bunch of people went, <gasps> You didn't reverence the word. I said, that's not the word. I was just barely born again. I said, that's the scriptures. The word is what God wants to hide in our heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart. <clears throat> so, it's funny, the rest of that verse is that I might not sin against thee. And so we go, okay, I need to hide the scriptures in my heart so that I don't sin. That's kind of what most people get out of that verse. I need to hide the scriptures in my heart so that I won't sin. And it's not even in my heart. I need to hide the scriptures in my memory. I need to memorize them so that I don't sin. But that's not what the verse says. It says, thy word, thy word, not just the scriptures. Thy word have I hid in my heart, not just my memory that I won't sin against you, not that I won't sin. You know, there's a difference between just going out and doing rank sin and sinning against God. Right? It's a big difference. It's a big difference. David's, David's the one who said that. What is that? Psalm 119? The enemy is first and foremost an enemy of God. Amen? He's first and foremost an enemy of God. Antichrist, not anti Mallory or anti Lindsay or whatever. <laughs> if he can keep the word, he, do, he, he doesn't care if you go to church. He doesn't care if you give tithes. He doesn't care if you um, go on little mission trips. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about all that. Go ahead and do it. As long as you don't get the seed, the word, that'll bring forth. Because see, the scriptures may just lay inside of your mind and memorized, as the Pharisees had to do it, but the word can bring forth life. Because it's seed. It's more than just letter. It's spirit. And so, you know, much of Christianity puts forth the importance of uh, ministry, the importance of prayer. You know, you can pray all day long and not reach God. I mean, is that possible? And can, I, can he say that? Anybody just thinking that? <laughs> can he say that? Yeah, you can pray all day long and not reach God. Because your prayers are so self-centered that he's like, you know, I can just see the Lord up there on the throne with a shield of faith in front of him. <laughs> he's going, I don't even want to hear this stuff. I died that those wouldn't be issues anymore. And you're acting like I didn't die on the cross. Can I get amen on that one? More than that, you're acting like you didn't die on the cross. <laughs> right? Okay, well, you did, and I did, and Paul did. 
What's the difference between you and I and Paul? Paul decided to believe it and put it into action. No, I'm sure we're trying to do that too. We should do that. But, but for sure he did it. This wasn't doctrine to him. This wasn't, oh, a religious, oh, this is a new religion. And God's using me to start a new religion. He's going after the Lord. And guess what? He's going after the, in the Old Testament, because that's the only book they had when he was around. He was the one who wrote the New Testament, but he didn't know it when he was writing it. He's just sending letters to the churches. And God said, that's going to be my, my word because it's coming out of you. There's so much that goes into that right there, and I don't, I don't want to get off on that. There's so much that goes into what I just said. Um, so the Lord is basically saying, here's my sacrifice. Here's my son. Because it all, in the Father's heart, He's not going, you, we have to understand, God is a God of altars, but he's really not. He's a God of the cross, but he's really not. He's a God of Christ crucified, the nature of the Lamb. Can you follow that? But altars were a type. And, the, you know, I mean, Jesus died on two pieces of wood, similar to the, what's right over there in the corner. Two pieces of wood put together. But God's not going, oh, holy wood. Well, that'd be Hollywood, but anyway. <laughs> you know, it's not, he's not, you know, like when a Notre Dame recently burned, they were so glad that they saved a thing that had a sliver of the cross in it. That's right. That was in the news. Well, first of all, the chances of them actually have a sliver of the cross. I mean, you know, is, is slim and none. Um, and second of all, what good is a little piece of wood? No, no, seriously, what good is a little piece of wood? What does that do to anything? If you ignore the true work of the cross, if you're not crucified, if you don't understand that I died with him and that's what counts, then you're going to worship a little piece of wood and go, this is really important. This is more important than anything. You know, this is, this is our top five relics. <laughs> I mean, you know, no wonder they seal it in that thing so it doesn't just disintegrate. It should have a long time ago, you know. Just let all, everything that can be shook be shook. But the cross, the true reality of the cross can't be shook and won't be shook. And especially it won't be shook in those that it has been planted, if you will, if you understand. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ, liveth within me. <clears throat> so, it's as if the Lord is saying, you drive away. You drive them away. I'm not going to drive them away. <clears throat> you say, why not? You know, <clears throat> because the sacrifice will not protect himself, right? He's not. That's his spirit. He's not the big. You know, what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I to this hour. We would say, Father, save me from this hour because it's horrible and this is unfair and this is bad and people are mean and I'm sweet and this is all going wrong. But Jesus said, what shall I say, save me? No. This is why I came. Isn't it interesting that that's in the Bible? I find it interesting because <clears throat> it is meant to clue us, it's meant to, to wake us up to the life we now live in the flesh. Christ. Christ in you. See? I thought, I thought somebody said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Didn't, they, didn't somebody say that? Oh, yeah, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but not in me. 
I wouldn't want him to be that way in me because I wouldn't want to have to suffer unjustly. Well, if you're going to live in this world, you're going to suffer unjustly whether it's Christ or not. That's just the way of the world, okay? You're going to meet all kind of stuff, and people are going to do things to you and me, and, you know, and it's going to hurt more than a splinter from the cross. You know, I have one too. <laughs> you know, it's right here in my finger, and it hurts. Oh, my God, you should have died on the thing. Stop carrying it around. <laughs> And I'm not going to say it. Some of, I've said it before, and some of you have heard me say it, but, I, you know, it's the truth, but, you know. But we, we whine over things that, if it, if it really was, as it were, spiritually a splinter from the cross, we whine over that because, we first of all, we don't see it as a splinter from the cross. You understand what I'm saying. I'm using that as an example of a circumstance that was unfair that God allowed to happen so that you could release Christ, the spirit of the lamb in that situation, and open not your mouth or not rail back against them because they railed against you. Or, you understand what I'm saying? But you just had a little one of those. But if you don't understand it, then you go, Lord, Take this cup away. And then he's, there, there's a pause and a silence, and then we go, no, I mean it. <laughs> You're supposed to say, not my will, but thine be done. But, you know, well, no, I mean it. Take it away. This is, this is hard. You know, and you've got to realize that who you're talking to really is Jesus, the one who died for us. And he's going, this is Remember, I mean, we don't like this part of the truth, but it is, it's still his life. Jesus said to Paul, or said to, to Ananias, I guess, he said, go tell him what, how much he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. I remember when I read that when I was a new Christian, I went, I thought, I thought you already did all that for I really did. I mean, I'm going, I got Oh, and then I went, oh, yeah, yeah, that's Paul. <laughs> I did. I went, yes, of course. But now, now that the gospel is coming to all the earth, I'm okay, and it's going to be good. And, you know, and if he shows me what things I'll have to suffer, I'll stand there boldly and go, yes, I'm with you. But I'm not picturing anything of the lamb. I'm picturing some sort of dreamy, ridiculous thing that I'm being persecuted and I'm just going to, you know, I mean, even that we won't be able to take too well. <laughs> it's like, this ain't right. That's us. That's, that's exactly us. That's the first thing pops up. First thing that comes up. Well, this ain't right. And if it's done by a Christian, we go, this ain't right. This ain't God. This ain't of God. I know they're saved, but this is, this, they're, they're kind of a bad Christian. They're bad at being a Christian. <laughs> they're even worse at, at being one with Christ. <laughs> I wonder if I can take a sip of this without it tasting like. Nope, not yet. All right. So you're chasing the fouls away. But what are you really doing? What are you really doing? You're focusing on the altar. Yeah, you're focusing there. You and then if this comes in, you get away. And then focus back on the cross. And then this comes, you get away. And then focus back on the altar. Get away and on the sacrifice, Christ crucified. Get away. We all have that experience. Some of you have it every day. <laughs> you know, you do realize, and I believe this. That if you keep, if you just keep it up and you be faithful and you be consistent, 
the enemy will quit trying to attack you that way. He's, you know, you know, in my early day, and I've told this before, but I mean, in my early days, <clears throat> when I first got saved, um, I mean, I would start having really bad dreams. You know, I mean, just like, golly, you know. And then the devil would, you know, I think the devil would give me those dreams, and then he would come in the morning, he would say, well, that's really what's inside of you. No, that's what he's, that's, that's what he said. That's really what's inside of you. And I went, oh, <laughs> it's worse than I thought. <laughs> Which I had good reason to think it was pretty bad. But anyway, <laughs> but now it's worse than I thought. Because those dreams were pretty bad. I'm just going, golly, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, so then I thought, if the enemy's planting these dreams and then trying to really destroy me by thinking that that's what I am on the inside, uh, then I need to make a stand that what I am on the inside is I'm a new creation in Christ and his life. It's his life, and I'm dead. And so whatever this is, I don't know, but it ain't me because the word of God says da 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 And you make that stand. And then I re realized that I didn't need to wake up every morning and go, <laughs> I just had a horrible dream. So I decided I would wake up and go, praise God, I had a great night's sleep. The Lord was good, you know, he sees my life and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I picture this, this little thing of Satan sitting on his throne and this little furry demon coming in and the reports of the devil and, and the devil goes, uh, uh, something has happened here because he ain't getting it. It's like, what's going on here? And the little furry demon, little hairy demon says, uh, well, I shot this bad stuff at him, but it must have ricocheted and hit somebody else. And he goes, well, go back and do it again. And he does it three or four more, five more times. And finally, Satan says, forget it. Let's try something different. Forget it because it's not having an effect. How does he know it's having an effect? You wake up every morning and go, eh, eh. you know what I'm saying? Just be with the Lord. Just say what the word says. Say with, confess. The word confess the Lord, you know, means to say with him. Speaking of the Greek. <laughs> say what he says. Be with him. And the enemy does, you know, then he'll, he'll try to change tactics, but, you know, you actually can get to a place where it's like, you know, you really don't have a lot of relationships with Satan. <laughs> it's like, he's not talking to me and I ain't talking to him. In fact, I wrote a song about it. What, what, what is the name of it? Um, Farewell to Satan. Anyway, if you ever want to listen to it, it's probably on the website, right? Friends of Life and the Spirit. Anyway, we're not making much progress here. <laughs> Amen. All right, so, uh, so it is important that we realize that, 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 that the focus is the cross. The focus is the altar. The focus is the sacrifice. I, I want to keep this thing pure. I want to, you know, and it's not, the purity of it is itself, but I don't want the enemy getting in. Because, you know, the enemy can come tell you all kind of stuff, too, about that. I, the, a perfect example is that when Jesus died, all this junk came up, you know? I mean, the, okay, so we go, we go, okay, Easter morning, it's, you know, anybody ever been to a sunrise service? I have, a bunch of them, because in the orphanage we had to go. <laughs> and uh, so we're out there, and the sun's not coming up, and we're all sitting in chairs outside, you know, and the music's playing, and then the sun starts coming up as, this, as the day began to dawn on resurrection morning, you know, and we're all sitting there, birds are singing, and you know, and it's fresh dew on the ground, and we're going, oh, oh, it's, 
it's resurrection morning, yes, you know, we're all rejoicing and stuff like that. Well, it wasn't that way in the Bible because the guys came, you know, and reported to, to um, Pontius Pilate and told him, you know, this stuff. And he said, well, tell him this. The body's gone. He said, well, tell him this. The disciples came and stole it away and started spreading all this stuff. And there was a, all this stuff. It was like muddying the clean, clear resurrection morning that we want. You understand? That's the way it was. And some people heard this and said, well, that's probably so, because who can be resurrected or whatever, you know? Or, you know, I heard about, you know, Bartholomew, he's capable of stealing the body. You know? It's <laughs> something like that. And all, there's this mixture and all this. It's not that beautiful. Oh, the sun, that sun's rising and the dew and the birds are singing. It's resurrection morning. You know, now you're going to have to chase those freaking vultures away. <laughs> Amen? You've got to stand firm. That's how you do it. You stand firm on the truth as it is in Jesus, not the truth as it is in other people's mouths or the truth as it is in, is, uh, in the Methodist church or whatever. Well, how is it in the Lord's heart? How is it as he sees? So that's what I meant when I said keeping the sacrifice pure. The sacrifice is pure all in itself, but we're trying to keep the muddies from being watered if no other place than in us, in us. We hold fast. You, doesn't it say that in Hebrews? Hold fast. The what? The doctrine that we've been told? Well, the sure, but it's the reality of Christ. The reality of Christ. And, uh, and then I, as I said something before, the sacrifice will not protect himself. Jesus hung on that cross. And they could say whatever they wanted to, you know. Why? You know, somebody could go, well, you know, this guy, he's pretty powerful when he walked the earth, but he's got both hands nailed, got both feet. This is a bully talking. So I can do anything he wants, because I, that's a bully. I can do anything he, uh, I want to him because he has no ability to strike back. So, you know, well, you know, if there was a bully standing there, and there was, because I think the Pharisees and the chief priests were, all the things they said, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. See? Jesus could have just said, okay, you know, chief priests and Pharisees, Puddles of puke. Right? That's not his spirit. He's not going to do that. He doesn't need nails to, to keep him from doing that. We do. <laughs> but he doesn't need him because that's not his spirit. So he's, the sacrifice is not going to protect himself because why? Because he's a sacrifice. That's why he won't. Because he is a sacrifice. He's not being murdered. Maybe in their hearts he is. Not in his heart. Not in the Father's heart. I'm, I'm not being murdered. You know. He doesn't have all this angst and everything over it. Because he's with the Father. And he's with the, with the Godhead having that spirit. And... So he's going to complete it. He's going to finish. He's going to finish what he was here for. And he says that in John 17. I finished the work. Glorify thou me with your own self. <laughs> he didn't say glorify me. He said glorify me with you. <laughs> that's, that's the glory to my heart. Is you. 
And then we have the demon appearances or the devil and they will attack the cross. They did again then. They, that's what's going on here in Abraham's day. That's what was going on when Jesus was hanging on the cross. That's what goes on today. People go, well, that's not right, you know. That's, that stuff about being dead with Christ or that stuff, you know, about, you know, the lamb living in you. We're victorious. Well, we are victorious. My God, we're more victorious than they are. I mean, th let me tell you, it takes more strength, it takes more victory to stay on the cross than it does to come down from it if you can. Right? You're a stronger person if you stay up there, not if you come down and show off that you can come down. So they attack the cross and discredit it. They come to rob it of his glory, you know, to rob Jesus of his glory, the glory of his death. You know, you remember throughout Jesus' ministry, something would happen, even from his first miracle, first miracle. Miracle at the wedding of Cana. You know, his mom says, hey, do that thing. You know, turn this water into wine. And Jesus does it, but he says, my hour has not yet come. And then another situation comes along. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. In fact, I was sharing on this on the blog. What was it called? What? The hour of what? The hour Jesus wants you most. I thought you said the hour of Masi most. I'm going, I don't know that guy. Anyway. <laughs> Twelve hours also. So, um, he finally comes to the place of the cross. John 12, 22, 23, then, then he just blurts it out in verse 24. But just before he says that, when he's talking about being crucified, being a corn of wheat falling into the ground and dying so that more fruit will come forth, he says, the hour is come. He finally gets to say that. The hour is come that the Son of Man will be glorified. What's he talking about? The next two verses spell it out. He's talking about dying on the cross. He's calling that the hour of glory. You know, we go, well, that's fantastic. My God, that is amazing. God goes, of course. The Holy Spirit goes, well, yeah. That's the way this works. Good job, Jesus. Yeah. The hours come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. Except the corner wheat fall into the ground and die, it'll be alone. And that's true, you know. That's true. Like when they opened one of the pyramids up, they found the tomb of one of the pharaohs and they had a thing of wheat there and you, you could go literally go take that urn that had been in there for before Jesus came. We're talking around Moses' time or later and take one of those seeds of wheat and put it in the ground and if it dies, what's it going to do? It's going to bring forth fruit. You go, <laughs> well, it will. It will. Because the principle is always there because it's an eternal principle of the heart and nature of God. It's an eternal principle of the Father, and that's why he doesn't declare himself. He declares the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Son declares the Father, and that the Spirit will come, and the Spirit declares the Son, and that everything it, with them is not about themselves, and that's what makes us receiving the nature of Christ within us, the life of Christ within us, 
different from the Old Covenant. Because the law in the Old Covenant made it everything about us. If you don't do this, you better do that. If you do this, that's good. If you don't do that, da 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 da. You know, all this, it's always focusing on yourself. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not. But we've received new life. New life, but it's a different kind of life. See, see the new life isn't, well, I had my life and now I has him, have his. The new life is my life was a dumpster of junk and his life is so selfless that he glories in the moment where they're going to crucify and mistreat him to the max. And he's, he's not doing it to see, you know, it's, this isn't a strong man contest to see if he can go through it. This is for others and for the Father. This is to glorify the Father. But he's being glorified in that he's able to give himself unto the Father. A lot of people don't look at it like that. They only see it, he died for me, he died for my sin. Uh, first and foremost, he died for the Father. He died for the Father. Anyway. So also, the, the demons appear and then make it appear as if something is wrong with the sacrifice. Something is wrong with this sacrifice. This Something isn't right here, you know. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. If you don't, you're not the son of God. See? Makes it appear as if there's something wrong and, and something wrong with the sacrifice. Now, they might not, the, the chief priests and Pharisees didn't identify it as a sacrifice. They identified it as the right thing to do to a, not just a criminal, but a heretic. Worse in the religious realm of the Jews. That's worse than being a criminal. He was a heretic. He was against everything they believed in their minds. And yet he's fulfilling everything. <laughs> you know, the fulfillment of all of them. But they can't see that. So it's, you know... They're making it appear as something's wrong with the sacrifice when, in fact, the Father is totally accepting that. It's a sweet savor to him. And I'm going to get hit two more here, and then we'll stop. And then people can assume the worst. You know, uh, I heard once over a situation somebody said, there was a situation where something really was of God and somebody said about that, they said, um, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> well, that's just a catchy little saying, but actually a lot of times where there's smoke, there's just embers, it's not full blown fire. But anyway, they're going, you know, their point was that um, well, this little thing, you know, let's say there was a demon there in something or somebody. I don't know. I'm just trying to point out. I'm trying to follow the line here and whatever. And they go, it would be like this. Uh, looking at Abram's sacrifice and saying, well, there's fowls, fowls coming down on that. That's got to be the devil. They're gathering to Satan himself. You see what I'm saying? And somebody go, well, there's, where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, I, I heard that and I thought, you know what? You need some smoke and fire if you'll get on the altar. But that's just, you know, because that's what it takes. That's the only way we're going to line up with God and his heart. And then, again, I've said this one, but the attack is not against us, but it's against him. Um, well, let me just add this last one. But God made the sacrifice vulnerable. God made, God the Father allowed his son to become a man. The son of God. 
became vulnerable, and so much so that he was crucified. That could never have happened unless the father intentionally allowed his son to become vulnerable. No way. Can't happen. And you could even say, God the Father put him in a form where he could be massacred. Okay? Because that's what it looked like. Again, it wasn't a massacre. It was a sacrifice. It was, it was an offering acceptable unto God and that saved the whole of who, humanity, whosoever will. But to do that, he was put into the most vulnerable of position he could be put into as the son of God. And he let men of the earth who had, more, who had almost no power wield power over him and bring him to suffering and death. Remembering that he could have called 10,000 angels, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't and he didn't. He remained vulnerable and he allowed the massacre to happen. And he did it for us. He did it for the Father. He did it because it's his nature. He did it because, what shall I say then? Father save me. <laughs> for this cause came. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm here. Father, we just thank you for your spirit, your son. We thank you that you would allow your son to go through that and uh, in so doing that you, um, you brought him to the highest honor that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. But, Father, what are they confessing in the book of Revelation? They're confessing the slaughtered lamb, the slain lamb that is worthy. Worthy is the lamb, not worthy is the son of God, not worthy is the king, not worthy is the resurrected one, but the slaughtered lamb is worthy. And that's the way you see it because you see in that two words, slaughtered lamb, you see the full manifestation of the nature of you of the Godhead, of the Trinity, that Jesus came and was the express image of God. So we love you, and we do want, when we approach the word, we want to be more sensitive, realizing that there's a person involved with this. There's your heart. We're not just in a Bible school or in a church studying or doing the Christian thing. We are wanting to know the invisible God and we want to know you from your insides out, not from your outside in, from your inside out. And then we want it built into us so that we are filled with your son and the life and nature of the way that he is. We look for it, we trust you for it, and we lower our hearts so that we can reach it. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, boys and girls.